Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Yijian Zhen, and I'm from University of Twente, the Netherlands. Together with my co-author, uh, Bob Shu, we would like to thank a lot for the opportunity here to share our study about the impact of land model physics on estimating uh, soil moisture and temperature profiles with an ensemble transfer common filter. We are going to use a case study in Padangjalan Desert. Uh, before we go to data simulation part, we would like to start with the soil heat and the moisture flow mechanism as a trial to explain our motivation on considering the impact of model physics. Back to 2008, we were fortunate enough to put up a field campaign in Badanjaran Desert, and from this experiment, we evaluate how the liquid and the vapor fluxes transport within the sand dune. Basically, both the liquid and the vapor fluxes are driven by temperature gradient or soil metric potential gradient. The fluxes driven by temperature gradient is called uh, thermal fluxes, and the fluxes driven by metric potential is called isothermal fluxes. This diagram shows that during the daytime in the topsoil layer, the thermal fluxes are downwards because, uh, since the surface temperature is much higher than the subsurface temperature. At the same time, there are also upward thermal fluxes transported towards the surface from the deep soil, and one can find such kind of a thermal flux convergence plane. On the other hand, at the same time, you can also find the isothermal flux divergence plane. So such kind of a convergence and divergence plane can actually cause the vapor liquid circulation at both shallow and deep layer. In the shallow layer, uh, the downward uh, thermal vapor flux will condense on the convergence plane, and then the liquid at the divergence plane will be transported and evaporated at the surface. As such, you can see such um, a vapor liquid circulation. In the deep soil layer, one can find such a circulation as well, but the direction is opposite. Although such kind of a vapor liquid circulation is inferred from the observation, there is a theoretical explanation that is based on the paper by Philip and de Vries, 1957. In the paper, Philip and de Vries used the vapor enhancement factor to describe the soil vapor flow. According to them, uh, the, philosophy, uh, the philosophy behind is that uh, the liquid islands about the points of contact between particles were not the barriers to vapor transfer but it were rather regions of accelerated uh, transport. Along with the temperature gradient, the vapor condensed on the upper stream end of the um, uh, liquid island and rapidly passed through the liquid uh, island by capillarity and evaporated at the downstream ends. This concept includes two aspects. First, uh, because of the different thermal conductivities of uh, soil, uh, water and uh, air, the microscopic thermal gradient across air field pores would be greater than the average macroscopic temperature gradient measured across the uh, uh, soil sample. So they replace the Tutorowski factor with a single dimensionless correction factor to account for both the increased uh, Tutorowski um, of soil over air and the underestimation of the effective temperature gradient. The second part is that, with the consideration of the vapor enhancement factor, the vapor not only transport in the pores, but also in the liquid islands. This causes an increase in the effective cross-sectional area available for uh, vapor flow. To account for this mechanism, the air field velocity was replaced with uh, this part. The PDV theory explains well that the soil water vapor flow is actually a series of uh, condensation evaporation processes and it can be used to describe the vapor liquid circulation as we hypothesized in the previous slide. Nevertheless, the PDV theory cannot explain all the uh, vapor transfer mechanism in the soil. As we know, water vapor is actually a gas phase of water then if the air within the soil is moving, the vapor will be also moving with it. From this plot, we can see that with the fluctuation of atmospheric pressure, there's a barometric uh, pumping uh, uh, process for the uh, soil air. This subsurface symbolizes a pneumatical tracer movement, and one can see that when the thickness of unsaturated zone is increasing, it is more dramatic, the movement 
of soil air responding to this barometric pumping. And as you can see here, this is uh, for three meter, 10 meter, uh, 25 meter uh, unsaturated zone. This triangle line is the for the 25 uh, meter thick unsaturated zone. And we can see that the barometric pumping of this particular event can cause the air at 90 centimeter moving out of the soil. So this is very significant. It is therefore necessary to evaluate <clears throat> how the airflow impact the uh, vapor movement on top of the PDV model. To facilitate that purpose, we developed the STEMIS model to consider the simultaneous transfer of energy, momentum, and mass in unsaturated soil. It considers three driving forces, temperature gradient, measured potential gradient, and the air pressure gradient. And with these driving forces, the transport of water vapor, dry air, and heat are fully coupled in the soil. This slide shows how different models perform in terms of estimating soil temperature, moisture, and uh, evaporation flux over this slide. It is obvious that the model considering airflow can simulate better the evaporation than the model without considering the airflow, especially for the date right after rainfall event. The prediction accuracy has been improved about uh, one third. For soil moisture estimation, different models also give different estimates. The one considering airflow has a higher moisture content. Uh, it is to note that the in situ observation at 20, 30, and 40 centimeters are very flat, and this could be caused by the failure of sensors in detecting the very dry um, uh, soil. Uh, with uh, which has a very low soil moisture content. And for soil temperature simulation, it seems different models do not make such difference, or let's say much differences, except for 50 centimeter, there's a slight difference between the two models. With the above, we know different model physics will lead to different uh, simulations of soil moisture and consequently the uh, surface evaporation flux. Then it comes to the main question of this study. If we apply different model of physics in a data simulation scheme, how they will impact the estimate of soil moisture and temperature profiles? Just to recap briefly uh, the different model uh, physics here, within the stimulus, we have the fully coupled transfer of water vapor, dry air, and heat. It is called a DMVA, so representing the diffusion model plus vapor and airflow. Then if we neglect the airflow mechanism, it is called DMV, uh, the diffusion model plus only vapor flow. At the last, the DM model, the diffusion model that does not consider the strong coupling between moisture and heat flow, therefore no vapor flow, no airflow. Okay, before using these three different model physics in the data simulation scheme, they are all calibrated with the in-situ observation. These are the calibrated results for both soil uh, moisture and soil temperature. All these three uh, models perform more or less the same. In this study, the ensemble transform uh, comma filter is used. The major difference between the ensemble comma filter and the ensemble transform comma filter is the way of calculating ensemble anomalies update. The rest are the same concept. And the details will not be explained here, and you are referred to Sarkov and the OK 208 paper in monthly weather review. Well, here the observation used in this study include the soil moisture at the depth of 10 cm and the soil temperature at the depth of 2, 5, 10, and 20 cm. There are four data simulation scenarios. The first scenario or observation was assimilated with a 30 minute observation interval. In the second scenario, the sparse temporal observation interval were designed to assimilate the observation at all depths. The third scenario is designed to assimilate only the surface soil moisture and the temperature, while the last one is designed to assimilate only the surface soil moisture uh, measurement. In the coming slides, only the results from the first and the last scenario were presented. Okay, so this is the result for assimilating all observation uh, information. When all observation information is used, the assimilation result is perfect in terms of matching the in-situ observation. Although for soil temperature, the DA result is a bit overestimation 
at uh, 20 centimeter when it is compared with the open loop it does improve quite a lot uh, in order to compare the performance of different line model physics in terms of estimating soil moisture and the temperature, a performance index is proposed. The bigger the performance index, the better the model performs. This is the performance index of the three models for assimilating or observation information. For soil moisture, the three models perform more or less the same. For soil temperature, the complex models outperform the simple model. The complex model here is a DMV and DMVA. As I mentioned, we have six observation intervals. Uh, with each observation interval, we have 16 data simulation results because we are using 16 pairs of model errors. So with each observation interval, we have six, 16 um, uh, root mean square errors between the data assimilation result and the observation data. When the data assimilation result is good, the spread of these 16 root mean square errors will be small like this. If the data assimilation result is not good, the spread will be big, uh, like in soil temperature result. So from this figure, you can see how different observation interval can affect the data assimilation result. For soil moisture result, it thinks there's a certain pattern there. Uh, the root mean square error doesn't increase monotonically, but with a kind of uh, saw shape uh, variation. This is the result for assimilating only surface soil moisture observation. The similar conclusion as the last slide can be drawn from here. Uh, you see the similar pattern, the soil shape for soil moisture result and for soil temperature result. Complex models uh, DMV and DMVA uh, outperform the simple model. For soil temperature uh, result, the gray lines represent the open loop running. So if the spread of loop mean square error close to this line or even below this line, it means that the data simulation result is good. In this case, we can see that DM models root mean square error spread are much further from the gray line than the DMV and DMVA model. This indicates that DM cannot constrain the soil temperature dynamics with a limited observation information. On the other hand, both DMV and DMVA uh, can constrain better the soil temperature dynamic with limited observation information. So if we check the performance index results, this conclusion is reinforced. From here, you can see that the DM model performs worse with increasing depths in different, with different observation intervals. You can find the similar pattern. While for DMV and DMVA, you cannot see such, uh, you cannot see such pattern. Okay, conclusions. From the above, it is clear that in this specific case, then surface physics does not play a critical role in affecting soil moisture DA results. However, for soil temperature, the comprehensive model physics does uh, outperform the uh, simple model in terms of estimating the soil temperature profile. It seems the simple model cannot constrain the soil temperature dynamics, particularly at the deeper uh, soil layer when the observation of soil temperature is limited or not available. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for your attentions and uh, questions are welcomed.